and welcome back to another one of my YouTube videos. Uh, today is Guitar Secrets time and today we are going to talk about a guitar player nobody knows. <laughs> well, of course this is exaggerating, but um, I want to talk about John Valentine Caruvas today. And most of you folks will probably guess now who the hell is John Valentine Caruvas. Well, um, first of all, John Valentine Caruvas was an excellent guitar player. Um, he played for Clock DVA in the early 80s, um, but I um, got aware of him when he saw, joined Susie and the Banshees as a replacement for Robert Smith mid-80s, 1985, 1986, and proceeded to record two albums with them, the first being Tinderbox, and the second one being uh, Through the Looking Glass, a collection of cover songs uh, in 1987. Um, actually, this record, Tinderbox, released in 1986 and featuring the hit single Cities in Dust, uh, was the first Susie album I ever bought. I bought it a few years later and uh, I was uh, instantly fascinated by uh, all of the music and the guitar playing in special. So the first guitar player for Susie and the Banshees I got to know was John Valentine Caruthers. Um, he, of course, was always overshadowed by the two uh, men who played guitar in that band before him. The ever so brilliant John McGeorg, I did a video on him, and the also brilliant Robert Smith, who is most famous for his work with The Cure. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm going to close the triplet today and talk about John Valentine Caruthers' contribution to Susie and the Banshees, and uh, I'm going to uh, talk about his contribution on Tinderbox exclusively, um, because there his guitar playing really shines. The other album he did is a collection of cover songs, and it's more synthesizer-heavy music. Um, it's also brilliant. Uh, you should definitely check that out as well. This is really, really good guitar playing, and it has been overlooked for a long time now, and I want to do some justice to the brilliant guitar playing of John Valentine Groover. So let's get going. The album kicks off with a brilliant song. It's got a brilliant opener and it instantly caught my attention when I listened to the record back in the day. Um, the song is called Candyman and after a short intro, John goes into a main riff which shows a lot about his contribution to Susie and the Banshees. Of course, John uh, orientated himself after the things John McGeeuk did, but he also threw in his own little spice and, well, um, for post-punk music, the music on Tinderbox is relatively fast. Um, a lot of the songs exceed 140 beats per minute, and Candyman uh, even clocks in at 155 beats per minute, so it's a very upbeat song, and John has got this very brilliant riff. <laughs> And as you see, he takes every eighth available. He takes every subdivision available and plays a note on it. And he does so by introducing pedal notes. And um, here you can see uh, the tone he sets for the rest of the song. Because in the chorus, he does something similar. And even in the middle part, he keeps playing every eighth note available. And uh, at the end, he even, well, um, tops that by ascending on the scale. Notice his use of the Mechio chord here. Um, and uh, by playing it that way, um, he creates kind of a breathless atmosphere by this very fast picking. And not a lot of post-punk guitar players did that. Um, it's not the shreddy, fast picking which was so popular in the mid-80s. Um, it's kind of chord apachos he plays. Um, but nevertheless, this is typical of his playing on Tinderbox. The second thing which struck me when I listened to the record again a few days ago uh, was a rhythmic thing in John's playing. He employs groups of three a lot. So he groups three notes together. And of course, if you play against a 4-4 backbeat, which he does for the entire album, that creates a movement in the bars. Um, and if you take, say, two bars of 4-4, you've got 16 eighth notes uh, you can accentuate or not. And if you decide to uh, use group of threes, there are two ways people usually do that either they put the groups of three 
up front or at the end, uh, creating rhythms like these. Here the groups of three would be up front. And here they would be at the back. If we now listen to the chorus of Candyman, which goes like this. You see that he does it differently. Um, by taking the three high strings, you've got automatically these groups of free thing going. Um, but he does it, he takes two notes, and then he takes the groups of three, and then another group of two. But maybe you see it differently. Yeah, you can also view it that way. And uh, there are two ways to view this rhythmical figure. Either two, three, 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 two, or three, 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 two, two, which is the traditional way. And John, well, he doesn't play accents really much. He plays it just like this. And let's you, the hero, decide. That is very clever. He also goes on to play groups of three in the sweetest chill, which is entirely constructed on groups of three. And you see the whole riff is constructed on groups of three. Here are the four notes to complete the bar, and then into another group of three. With four notes to complete the bar. Here he uh, takes the division three, 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 two, two, which is quite traditional. Um, so you see there are lots, lots, lots of examples where he does it. For example, in Lance and he also plays groups of three. And uh, you can see little riffs all over the records where he groups three notes together uh, to create that kind of movement in the bar. If you have watched me playing closely in the last minutes, you have already seen what is also a key technique to John's playing for Susie and the Banshees. It's his use of stretches, of stretch chords, actually. Um, he, it's very obvious in The Sweetest Chill, where he goes to fret uh, a C minor at nine chord. Yeah, by stretching here from here. And goes then over to... Which is technically also a stretch, yeah? Um, there are more stretches on the album. Um, the aforementioned chorus for Candyman is a stretch. Um, you can see it here, yeah? And um, you find a lot of these uh, on the record, actually. Um, it's because John wanted unusual voicings for his chords, requiring him to stretch over the fretboard at times. As usual, a few words on the guitar tone are going to close this video. Um, the most special thing about John's uh, equipment uh, was his guitar. Uh, he used a Hofner TS6, which was uh, ES335 style guitar by the company Hofner, a little bit thinner than the Gibson ones and without F-holes, but the special thing wa were the electronics. It was equipped with two Dimasio pickups, which could be switched into active mode, and uh, when you switch them back into passive mode, you wouldn't have a volume drop by a very clever circuit design the guys at Hofner did. Um, so uh, that was really special for him, playing with active electronics, um, which is also something not done very much in the post-punk community, and uh, even more unusual, putting these active electronics into a thin line guitar. Um, well, the second thing um, 
was his amp setup. Like John McGeoch, he employed a twin amp setup consisting of a Roland JC120 for clean tones and a Marshall for the distorted ones. And he could either blend them or via a splitter box access either of them. Uh, while John McGeoch used a Marshall JCM800, then a new amp by Marshall, um, John Valentine Caravas played uh, a Marshall MV combo. Uh, but that is also a JMP style circuit. And the JMP, of course, is the father of the JCM800. Um, so there was not a big change in, 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 in amp set up there. And of course, in front of all these amps, he had the obligatory MXR flanger giving that lush tone uh, you might have heard uh, on the recording or me playing it. Um, so, um, yeah, that uh, added with lots of reverb and lots of delay, he used an Evertide delay. Um, gave him this lush yet big sound. Um, and uh, the recording process of John uh, was very similar to mine. I didn't know that until I did the research for this video. He uh, tracked everything four times, um, two on the ref left, two on the right side, um, which I also do. And you always hear four, sometimes even eight guitars play simultaneously, um, sometimes in different sounds that he layered, layered clean sounds with distorted ones and stuff. Um, and something John did do, which I do not do, is he kept in little mistakes. Um, he didn't like uh, record it new. He didn't do pungents. And he just played it and kept it if he liked it. Um, that way, he said, it sounded more natural. Um, this is a very cool recording approach, and I don't just say that because mine is similar. Um, and it makes the guitar sound very, very big on the album. Um, there's only a few synthesizers on the album to fill up spaces in the frequency spectrum um, because there are so many guitars interacting with each other, creating cool soundscapes all throughout the record. So, folks, that's all. Um, I hope you liked my video. If you did so, you might want to drop me a like or subscribe to my channel. I'd be very grateful if you did so. And in the meantime, have fun playing guitar.